What is a tree? That's a toad, isn't it? What is a fungus? <laughs> How do trees and fungi relate? Well, you've been all, already been told that partially. <laughs> partially. <laughs> How do our answers to the third question relate to our answers to the first and second questions? And how does this influence the way we relate to trees and fungi? What is a tree? Is it perhaps a stick in the mud? Is it a utility? Is it an obstacle or a threat of some kind? Is it perhaps an expression of natural energy flow? The tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. Some see nature as all ridicule and deformity and some scarce see nature at all. <coughs> but by the eyes of a man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. What is a fungus? Mm. Is it an ally? Is it an enemy? Or could it possibly be an expression of natural energy flow? Here's a view of a fungi from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. A sickly autumn shone upon the land. Wet and rotten reeds, <coughs> leaves reeked and festered under the foul haze. The fields were spotted with monstrous fungi of a size and colour never matched before, scarlet and mauve and liver and black. It was as though the sick earth had burst into foul pustules. Mildew and lichen mottled the walls, and with that filthy crop, death sprang from the water-soaked earth. One attitude is treating the tree, fungi, the world, essentially as a set of objects. We're thinking about organisms, the world, objectively, as an, an, a, a figure remote from us. William Blake is thinking about <coughs> organisms, the world, trees, fungi, empathic. So there's a huge difference between an empathic way of viewing the world and an objectivistic way of viewing the world. And all of us have been taught again and again and again to think objectivistically, to put distance between ourselves and what we observe. And this is even embedded in scientific method, that you know, it is actually thought a virtue to dislocate yourself from what you are observing in order to try to understand it and you say you're being impartial. No, you're not being impartial. You're being as partial as you can possibly get because you've left your own sense of relationship with what you're observing and your own understandings that come from within yourself out of the picture and you actually misunderstand what you're observing because you've removed something quite critical. Imagine natural space without material form. What could it be like? Can you just think of, let's, let's think of space without any form in it. What's it like? Uh, could it be formless? <laughs> okay, so we've got an interesting situation. There's a very intriguing inference here that natural space and bodily form are mutually inclusive, not mutually exclusive, as is assumed by abstract definitive logic. So we've been brought up to think in a way that splits material from space. You're even told again and again on Horizon programs that an atom is 99.99999% space. No, it isn't. It's 100% space plus energy. That, that takes us a little bit further, but there's something about the way we've taught ourselves to think that splits material from the immaterial. And when we do that, we become objectivists. 
So the inference is that natural space and bodily form are mutually inclusive, not mutually exclusive. Matter can't be dissociated from space and continue to exist. Your self-identity naturally includes your neighbourhood. So this is something very important because we've taught ourselves to think that we're isolated from our neighbourhood. When actually we're natural, we can't be isolated from our neighbourhood. We are inclusions of our neighbourhood. Imagine yourself now to be a dimensionless point in space. That's a thought, isn't it? That's what Euclid did. <laughs> okay, everything starts off as a, a dimensionless point in space. How could you become somebody? Well, if you're a dimensionless point in space, you can't become somebody just by standing still. You actually have to move. Yeah, if you, and if you sort of start moving and circulating around a point, yeah, you actually produce, you start to create a body. It's a bit like one fire awake night when we whirl sparklers around. Yeah, we whirl the sparklers around and we create a figure by very, very rapidly, yeah, whizzing the sparkler around. We've actually created a body dynamically which includes space within it, as well as the space throughout it and all beyond it. So we've arrived rather extraordinarily, not by thinking very hard, it's something that it took physicists a donkey's years to work out, leaving quantum mechanics and so forth, that all natural forms are intrinsically dynamic. They're mutually inclusive combinations of spatial stillness, and energetic flux. You are a combination of spatial stillness, <laughs> which you discover when you're meditating, and energetic flux when you're all agitated. But actually, you're agitated all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, I'm very agitated now. <laughs> We're arriving at an extraordinary thing. Natural geometry, real natural geometry, is flow geometry. We have been told to go back to square one. Natural geometry does not start with a square. It starts circular. Yeah, because it's, it forms dynamically. This is a painting which I did when I was president of the British Mycological Society. I didn't want to give them a paper when I left. So I gave them a painting instead. And the great thing was they had to publish it because I was a president. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of a scientific paper full of lovely data, <laughs> I gave them a painting. And uh, I didn't have any references in the book. In the time. <laughs> Question of health and disease. What's healthy, really? What's disease really? How do we think about healthy disease? Well, thinking about trees and fungi, how do trees and fungi relate to one another? And how does this, the way we think about relationship between trees and fungi <coughs> affect our idea of health and disease? Do they relate as independent co -op competitors and collaborators struggling for existence? That is the view we've all been brought up with. Yeah? The idea of a struggle for existence. And you're either a competitor or you're a com collaborator. Or, yeah? And it arises from that abstract, definitive view of the natural world that splits the material form from the spatial, from the immaterial, and removes the dynamic. Not only does it remove the dynamic, actually, it removes love. Because, and in that distancing of ourselves from the other, we lose sight, we lose our sense of love for the other. Or do they relate as needful flow forms? This is the simple natural inclusional view. This is all about not rights, but needs. Yeah, we don't have independent human rights, we have human needs. All organisms have needs. And that's what they're doing. Even that lovely cheetah, as you call it, is fulfilling its life needs. 
But they ain't got no chlorophyll. <laughs> so how's it going to live? Well, it's going to have to have to receive it from someone else. So let's look at the way that we're often taught in textbooks to think about um, relationships between organisms. This is a classic one that you see in a lot of the textbooks. Is it plus plus, meaning you're both sides are benefiting? Is it plus minus? One's parasitic, the other's not benefiting. Is it just neutral? It's a sort of plus minus uh, schema, sort of, which is trying to understand relationship in terms of cost and benefit. There's are problems with these. You haven't had thought about it in real life, how difficult it is to evaluate cost and benefit impartially. Have you ever noticed that this whole schema is about pairs of organisms, whereas in the real world, it's three or more? Have you ever thought about the fact that all this is being measured within a fixed reference frame? And that must have something to do with economics and the way we can think about Brexit and all that. They're all doing it in fixed reference frames. And it's purely transactional. It is utterly <coughs> neglecting context. Natural inclusional approach that I favour looks at relationships in terms of flows and counterflows. And it's impartial in the sense of it's looking just not the other way energy is flowing. I'm not particularly saying this is good, this is bad, this is beneficial or what. <coughs> it's contextual, it's inclusive of the neighbourhood. It's dynamic, it's accounting for changing circumstances. And it's evolutionarily open. Agents and agencies, thinking about health and disease. A wonderful statement on his deathbed by Louis Pasteur. Extraordinary, the founder of germ, germ theory. The microbe is nothing, the terrain is all. Suddenly he had realized that the story of disease was all about the living conditions of the organism and not a battle between enemy and, and, and goody. So, We've been brought up to think in terms of abstract agency, a abstract power, the quest for dominion in the struggle for life, about local action reaction, linear cause and effect, survival of the fittest, or very familiar ideas. If they're thinking actually more naturally, we're thinking more about self-sustaining, home-seeking and making, receptive, responsive, reciprocating. That's what relationships are. I receive from you, you receive, from, I mean it's true give and take, isn't it? We're talking about, like, and I think I far prefer to think in t of evolution in terms of the sustainability of the fitting and the survival of the fittest. And if we just sort of then look at the way we sort of rationalise this in an abstract sense, we tend to think of, of productive is healthy and fit and unproductive is, the, so it's all about production. Whereas if we're thinking more naturally, attune, or if think in terms of attunement, attuned is healthy and fitting, you're essentially fitting in with what's going on all around you, and discordant is diseased or misfitting. And these different perceptions may profoundly affect management attitudes and practice. Now back to my painting. <laughs> Trees as welcome homes for fungi. Here's my way of describing a tree in its relationship with fungi. A tree is a solar-powered fountain. Thought about it? Solar-powered fountain. Its spray supplied through wood-lined conduits and sealed in by bark until their final outburst in leaves. Within and upon its branching and folding water-containing surface and reaching out from there into air and soil, a branching and folding water-containing surface of a finer scale than mycelial networks of fungi, which provide a communications interface for energy transfer from neighbour to neighbour, from living to uh, from neighbour to neighbour, from living to dead, and from dead to living. That's trees and fungi <laughs> in a more fluid way of thinking. <coughs> Just 
sort of think about a tree a little bit, uh, I, I spent quite a lot of time looking at tree decay and how or fungi would actually bring about tree decay and establish themselves in the wood. And it was all about the distribution of water and air in the pipes. Too much water, you've got no oxygen. Too little water, it's dry, you dry out. Yeah. You've got to have just the right quantity of moisture and aeration to enable yourself to become active. And you might just think about, okay, if, if, if it's moisture content and aeration is so important, what actually does affect that in a tree? Very simply, wood and bark anatomy, seasonality, you know, whether a tree is, is, is pumping up water in, 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 the, in the spring, or whether it's inact, relatively inactive, the activity of inhabited organs, and oh, all sorts of things to do with that, but just sort of thinking of the tree as a plumbing system, as a self-plumbing system, and thinking how, yeah, water and aeration at levels fluctuate. That helps you to sort of understand when the conditions are right for a fungus to become established and when they're not. So fungi are most active where aeration and moisture supply are adequate but not excessive, neither too wet nor too dry, and the inhibitory chemical compounds are minimal. They can be present in latent or dormant form even when active growth is restricted. So actually one of the things I spent some time discovering is a lot of fungi can actually establish in the fully conducting water-filled water wood of living trees, but they wait until the conditions change and the wood becomes aerated and then they can burst into activity. Fungi can themselves make, make themselves more at home in wood in various ways and close encounters of fungal kind. Mm -hmm. It can be many and varied. What happens when fungi meet one another? Well, let's just sort of have a little bit more <coughs> looking at this. Firstly, homing in and around root roots. Rotters, communicators, and friends of the earth. That's fungi <coughs> are. And we can have parasitic and mycorrhizal and rhizosphere fungi. This is part of my painting, which is focusing on those, those, those particular kinds of organisms. Underground connections. And of course, this is one of the things that so it really came to the fore uh, about 20, 30, 40 years ago when it, we, we really began to understand that under, underground the, the fungal mycelium was not just forming mycorrhizas with particular trees, it was linking them together and so, so getting all the trees together into a communications network. Yeah? There's a huge variety of fungi that can grow in the dead heartwood of a tree, the non-living heartwood of a tree. And there they can cause a condition called heart rot. And we all know about this as children because we go and hide in heart rotted trees, yes? Fungal territoriality, what do they do when they meet one another? They're extraordinarily territorial creatures. And here are some illustrations of that territoriality. I want to sort of take you then to some really important communities conclusions. As we sort of, or one of the, of the sorts of things that I became aware of as a result of my interest in trees and fungi. And this is important because in sustainable commun natural communities, life is not a struggle for existence. Life is a gift of energy to be received, sustained and passed on in natural relay. Just think about that very different way of perceiving things. And this painting that I did is actually showing how new life emerges from the death of old life. 